Lukaizo is one of the most famous and difficult Pokemon ROM hacks of all time. Released at first in the early 2010s by legendary hacker Sinister Hooded Figure, the creator of sequels Crystal and Emerald Kaizo, this is a hack that is so tremendously difficult that most players give up on it before even getting more than a few gym badges. This is a game that constantly builds up in power to an amazing climax with some of the most intense sequences of Pokemon battles that I've ever had the pleasure of nuzlocking. The climb through Sylph against all odds, the 2 vs 1 in Victory Road, and so much more. Until recent years, the game itself was regarded by many, including large figures in the Nuzlocke community, as impossible to hardcore Nuzlocke. This was questioned by myself in 2021 after beating the game for the first time with Nuzlocke rules, just using items in battle. The next year in 2022 was the breakthrough for the game, as a hardcore Nuzlocke champion was crowned in STEM Studios. And then in 2023, two more followed, with Bugford and Jake Wonder Warden beating it in relatively quick succession. These runs were all amazing in their own rights, and took on the level 115 Elite Four with extraordinary skill and the utmost knowledge of Generation 1 mechanics. However, there was one thing I wasn't personally fond of. The almost mandatory use of something known as the Diglitch. I'll explain that a little more later. Later on though, they released a patch that reduced the Elite Four's level down from 115 to 101 being 14 levels lower than the original Elite Four, making a number of strategies not just more reliable, but more Pokemon being viable in general. And this is what I'm going to be playing on, with the main aim of winning this Nuzlocke without any single glitches. Otherwise, all of the regular hardcore Nuzlocke rules will apply. Permadeath, one encounter per area, level caps, and set mode will always be on. With that, this is the Pokemon Blue Kaizo Hardcore Nuzlocke. So you might be wondering to yourself, why would anyone bother with something that people said was impossible? To that, I say one thing, why the hell not? The first thing you have to do in Blue Kaizo is pick your starter. I'm sorry to all the Charmander stands out there, but your little guy is the only pick that isn't worth its weight in gold. Bulbasaur is amazing early, also evolving in time for you to take on most of Surge Split, being very handy for Brock with its 65 special and being a bulky mon later on, with it also being able to be a cut bot to add to its utilities. Squirtle is also a great Pokemon to have, with it being a bulky water and having great defenses. It being a pure water type is actually a really good thing, meaning it's great in a number of matchups throughout the run. It's also another Pokemon that's great to bring to Brock, as well with the cap of level 16, allowing you to have Bubble Beam Wurtle able to lower the speed on threats like Aerodactyl as early as the first gym. I go for Bulbasaur, and there's actually a funny little thing here. As on Route 22 west of Viridian, I could get a Squirtle for myself to have both of the great starter picks from the offing. However, rather than getting a starter, I get access to Nidoking to steamroll a lot of the early game. The only fight before Brock that could really ever leave a scratch on you is the final fight in Viridian Forest against a single Butterfree, for which you could be as high as level 15 or 16 to fight and for consistency's sake, I decided to set a save state right before Brock with some Pokemon already obtained. The main reason I did this is just because a lot of the early game is very free as you can be very overleveled in comparison to the AI, with some broken Pokemon like early level 20 Pidgeot and Raichu both available after Mount Moon. At the same time, I delay my Bulbasaur's evolution until after defeating Brock, as it actually gets Razor Leaf at a very early level. Brock himself though is actually surprisingly easy by Kaizo standards. All I need to do is kill the Golem turn 1 to ensure it doesn't self-destruct in my face, then I can kill Kabuto and Omanite, and then play around a little with Aerodactyl just to make sure I can get Pikachu in to Thunder Punch it to death. And that gets us the Boulder Badge, already. Yeah, that was really easy, huh? After defeating Brock with little to no trouble, I evolved Bulbasaur into Ivysaur, as well as Pidgeotto to Pidgeot. This big behemoth gets the uber buffed Razor Wind at the insanely low level of 21, with it now being a one turn move with a higher flinch chance and being stab 
This is simply enough alone to make this one of the best Pokemon in the entire early game, hands down. Pidgeot alone allows us to steamroll through Route 3, where I pick up the rather unfortunate Jigglypuff. This guy is really only going to be used as a sack at some point later on, as its offenses are just too poor to make anything out of. We can fly through these low level guys though and get along to Route 4, where ideally we'd get a Magnemite, a super good electric type that is a great backup if we lose Raichu. We actually get one of the more interesting Pokemon in the entire game. Psyduck is one of only two obtainable Pokemon that gets access to the move Amnesia. Amnesia in Generation 1 works a little differently to future generations as the special stat was combined into a single base stat, essentially making Amnesia a double calm mind which is simply ridiculous. Unfortunately for the Quacken, he has to wait until we get to Erika before he can click it at level 52. Mount Moon is realistically the first place in the game that anything can go wrong, with there being a couple of scary fights in here. At the same time, we get one of each stone, allowing us to get Raichu before we even get to Misty. Mount Moon gives me another Pokemon that'll die a similar fate to Jigglypuff in Paris. This little Parasite, while it gets Spore, is just too slow to use it, and just overall is a pretty terrible Pokemon in this game. Back to the scary stuff though. There's one grunt in here with a Ghastly and a Kadabra that if you get slept and confused, could very easily send you to Brockatory quicker than you could say Arsgas. And the super node at the back here protecting the fossils does have a clamping shoulder and booming eggs and balls. At this point though, I've played through the early game so many times over the years that I could probably go from Oak's Lab to Surge in less than an hour. After breaking through, we pick up a fossil that we have no intent on reviving, as there's a much, much better fossil later in the game. Now on our hit list is a very scary rival fight, and in my eyes, the first possible white point if you go in unprepared. But to be honest, a cracked Pidgeot is kinda cracked for a reason, and it takes out blue in just two seconds flat. We then fly up Nugget Bridge and pass this guy who has a guillotine pincer to get to routes 24 and 25, where we can pick up two new Pokemon in Krabby and Bellsprout. These guys probably won't see a lot of usage, but they're good to have there if I need to use them instead of something more valuable. Finally, we can be a Twitch chatter for Bill's VTuber stream, and he gives us his Hatsune Miku tickets. This unlocks Misty's gym. However, I'm going to delay this for a little bit, and go down south to get some more good stuff before fighting her. After deleting the Rocket Grunt off the face of Kanto, I can go along Route 5 to pick up a Tangler, a surprisingly consistent answer to a number of normal type Pokemon throughout the run, and a Hitmonchan who is unfortunately just kind of terrible. I can also go through to Vermillion as the trainers on Route 6 aren't too high of a level, aside from this one demonic beetle, and pick up a magic up for myself there. Now though, it's time to take on the Torrential Tyrant Misty. Her lead Vaporeon is a super bulky threat, and a single crit could leave you in tatters, but luckily for me, Raichu can two-shot it to take it down as Polaroth enters the field. Checking later, it turned out that I could Oko this, but I didn't realise that at the time, so I switched assuming I couldn't, to go out to Gyarados. Gyarados is slowly able to whittle its health down while trying to dodge lovely kisses from the frog, but gets to a point where it'll die from a crit. So I go over to my Victory Bell, who outspeeds and finishes the frog off with a Mega Drain. Third in is the sketchy Dugong, who could horn draw you to oblivion if you're not prepared, and I simply stay in and sack Victory Bell to retain momentum, before sending Raichu back in to kill off the Manatee and finish the Starmie, as it has no stab moves, winning my very own Cascade Badge for my Valiant Sacrifice of Bellsprout who got a total of 29 seconds of screen time after being caught. 07 to the first death of the run, but trust me, there's many more to come. With me going so much further forward in Misty Split than I probably needed to, it takes a good chunk out of Surge Split here. With there being nothing to worry about on Route 5, 6, and in Vermilion, we get to go forward into Diglett's Cave and catch the namesake, before preparing for the second gauntlet of the early game, and the much more dangerous one at that. This gauntlet has multiple Pokemon with Oko moves, strong threats, and many evolved Pokemon. This is also where one of the best Pokemon in the game, in my opinion, comes online in full force. Me? Yeah, no, it's Gyarados. You already know this guy is good, but in Gem 1, did you know that it actually has 105 special attack as well as special defense? And in Blue Kaizo, it learns Thunderbolt, Waterfall, and Body Slam all by level up. With it also picking up Blizzard at level 41, and Hyper Beam soon after that, it really wreaks havoc on the mid game, so I can't wait to get- Oh! Yeah, so it turns out you kinda need a good speed DV to make the most of Gyarados. Mine however had a whopping one speed DV. Insane. 
We're still not even one hour into the run at this point, and I'm without one of the Infinity Stones. So surely it's a reset, right? Well, if not for me having Raichu and the ominous Amnesia Golduck coming online soon enough, I probably would have had some reasoning to reset. But for now, we can just keep on keeping on and head on to the SSN. We can now venture onto the cruise, although we're a little late to the party, our rival definitely wasn't, and he's definitely had some drinks, because his team now is really stacked, with Mew and all three evolutions when they were actually good. This lead is semi-dependent on whether you beat the rival fight in the lab and the rival fight on Route 22 as to my knowledge, but to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Multiple times I've led something to beat Jolteon and Flareon, but been shown a Vaporeon lead, so I don't really know myself. I assume correctly and lead Venusaur against his lead Vaporeon, and I can go for a Razor Leaf to swiftly send him into red health as he switches to Jolteon, whilst I just hammer down with my Razor Leaves. I then go to Nidoking on the Jolteon to kill with a Horn Attack and follow suit on the Vape. Now it's just on Flareon and Mew to pick up the slack of the others for him. I then realise that I outsped Flareon and killed it with just a single dig as I go to Pidgeot on the Mew to try and slap it with a Razor Wind but I get paralysed on the switch in before taking a critical psychic to the face and getting fully paralysed. Raichu then gets body slam crit and paralysed on the switch in as well, so I have to swing again to my sand slash, who goes digging underneath the Mew and buries the rival's hopes in the ground. Turns out the captain was also day drinking and we get a cut HM for giving him a little rub on his back, so we can access the Vermilion City Gym, which starts out with a scary back to back fight. But as I said earlier, I've played this game so many times that with a quick skim over the calcs, I could blast through them. Now for Surge. Surge's shocking crew of electric dynamos is ready to send you packing faster than he did in the Pokemon War. With the bombing Bollock lead ready to take out at least one mon at all times with explosion and its ridiculous critical hit rate. I accidentally managed to lead the wrong Pokemon in Raichu here, who is absolutely not living an explosion from Electrode so I have to go to plan B already and steer across to Marowak who gets blown a load all over and lives on just under half HP. I then take the double edge like it's nothing from Magneton as I manage to click the wrong move on my Marowak in Rock Slide rather than Bone and Meringue. I'm happy to let this go down though so I stay in and risk the critical hit before dodging it and killing off the Magnet. Porygon comes in and is a little bit of an enigma. I go to my Raichu so I can't be Thunder Waved and resist the Thunderbolt but I instead get super unlucky as I don't just get hit by Ice Beam, but I also get frozen by it in the process making my life just that much harder as my reaction here suggested. We're bordering on steering territory here as not much is going right at all. So I go to my Hitmonchan who also decides to be completely abysmal and misses its submission. In response to that I just let it die to go and get Venusaur in who with guaranteed critical razor leafs does huge damage to 2 hit KO and is always living a critical hit to face up to Jolteon, going on a rampage to put it within an inch of its life, so I can then swing over to my Doug Trio who gets hit by Sand Attack before taking it out with Dig. I then sack Marowak to Electabuzz's Ice Punch, so I can go back to Dougie to get my accuracy back and take it out and the Ace Raichu in consecutive turns to get my Thunder Badge. Now we get a massive jump in the level cap from 39 to 54 with a hell of a lot of stuff to do in between the next two gyms. Route 9 gives us an amazing Pokemon for Erika, with Beedrill having Twin Needle, and in Generation 1, Bug types were super effective against Poison types. This means that Beedrill itself is 4 times super effective against 4 different Pokemon on the next gym fight. Route 10 on the way into Rock Tunnel gets me an Ekans for my trouble. Blue Kaizo kind of forces you to get Flash for Rock Tunnel, Unless you want to do what I did once and run around here for over an hour and a half in the dark. You should probably go get it. Not that it's a long detour or anything. I can get myself a great Mon in here though, as there's Mons like Geodude and Marchop, but alas, we get ourselves Golbat. This guy isn't exactly great at anything, but it's far from terrible with a very good defensive typing. Rock Tunnel itself is a two floor maze to a lesser extent than say, Cerulean Cave or something. But without Flash, as I said, it's disgusting. Most of the trainers in here are a fair few levels lower than us at this point though. They're still at a high enough level though that we've got to keep on our toes as one wrong switch in can leave us down an Elite Four Mon or even worse. Speaking of which... Yeah, you'd think I would have learned by now, right? <laughs> nope. My start of getting drilled harder than a freshman in college was not in the plans, but what can I do now? Well... Actually, I could get another one in the Celadon game corner, but we'll get to that shortly. 
The rest of the trainers in Rock Tunnel aren't any serious trouble, and we work our way through them in good time. Route 8 spanning between Lavender and Saffron City lines up as one of the most dangerous routes in the game, with multiple trainers solely focusing themselves on using Oko moves on the player. In Generation 1, if you outspeed a Pokemon at any point and are a higher level than the opponent, Hondra will never hit you. However, if you're slower, even if you're a higher level than the opponent, you can be hit at any point in time. At this point in time, I didn't really know just yet, and of course now it's a little different. Rat 8 ends up making me lose both Kingler and that certain little duck that I hyped up a whole bunch 15 minutes ago, both to Oko moves. Amazing, right? To make matters worse, these deaths were both to the final trainer in the route, and they're both probably preventable as well. Route 7 and Celadon City's encounters kind of encroach on one another, and what you get on Route 7 probably goes a fair way to determining what you get from the game corner. Now at last, I can head to the Celadon City Gym, where everything is rearranged in order for the player to have to fight all of the trainers. Honestly, the gym trainers in here were pretty easy, most of them only having one or two mons like Rock Tunnel. This leads us to take on Erika. This really is a fight that'll make or break a run. The Executor is lethal with 125 special and great bulk, and while we do have a little bee in our back pocket, it's not really going to do much to take out Clefable and Tangler. I'm going to be using something known as pre-status for this fight. This is where you add a custom status condition on your Pokemon before a fight like Paralysis or Burning, and in theory it sounds like a completely pointless thing in Gen 1, right? Why would you make your Pokemon worse and more frail than they need to be? There's no guts, no facade, no quick feet in this game, so what really is the point? The point here is that as you can see on Erika's team, a lot of her Pokemon carry status moves, and pre-statusing my Pokemon with a different status makes it so that she will never click any of them only focusing on raw dogging me with powerful attacks at all times. I led pre-parried Beedrill to try and force her to attack, but uh, yeah. In typical fashion, nothing goes my way, and I get fully paralyzed for the first two turns of the fight, leaving me in quite a state already. I have instant regret for pre-statusing my B and have to sack into Parasect to hit Leech Life to kill the Vileplume. I can then get Blastoise in on the Clefable, only for my special to be dropped as soon as I switch in, for her to also proceed to dodge my Blizzards. Nine Tails can sort out the clef, and then in comes Venusaur. I then just go back to Parasect to go for Leech Lifes to two hit KO the Venusaur, and then go to Arbok on Tangler just to end up getting tied up like Ishibari Enjoyer. Charizard, who I got from the game corner, handles Medusa and can sort out Victory Bell after dodging a crit. Now, though, my team's in an absolutely unreal state, with an Executor in front of me to handle still. I go for Flamethrower on the Egg to sack my Charizard so I can get Nine Tails in and finish the slaughter as I lost 3 mons to Erika, giving me double digit deaths for the run upon getting only my 4th badge. Pretty ominous signs if you ask me. This part of the game is generally where you can breach out in Kanto, with vanilla RBY allowing you to basically fight literally anyone, wherever and whenever you want. But in Blue Kaizo, Sinister Hooded Figure added a lot more linearity to the game, and forces the player to have to go to the Rocket Hideout to take out the corruption in the casino in order to access Pokemon Tower. Of course, as is per the status quo at this point, the hideout is reworked so you'll fight all of the trainers in there, and you can't necessarily see where you're going with the spin tiles. The first few fights are nothing bad as we're grossly overleveled in comparison to them all. But this trainer here, Grunt 4, in my eyes, is the most dangerous fight before Giovanni. This Grunt carries all three of Electabuzz, Magma, and Jinx, as well as a lead Kadabra. These three are all buffed in Blue Kaizo quite heavily, and a single crit is costly. My ass is stupid and leaves Raichu in on the Jinx, costing us its life. A pretty trivial way to lose a Mon to be honest, but it is what it is. We can get another electric post surf, so it's not all over. We work our way through the rest of Rocket Hideout getting to Giovanni in the back, and his first encounter is really nothing to scoff at. The lead Persian only carrying Hypnosis and Slash can send you to the lab quicker than you can blink with its blistering speed making it able to put almost anything to sleep instantly. The higher level Dugtrio is able to slam you with powerful ground moves, and the dangerous Fissure, which as we know, I'm a little silly with. The Nidos being bulky enough to live hits from most things and clap back with their own super powerful attacks and sleep, Rhydon, arguably the most powerful raw rock type in the game, and Tauros, the true powerhouse of Gen 1's OU Big 4. This fight in my eyes is a true skill check, and can be kind of a run ender if you're not careful. I lead my pre-poisoned Pidgeot to go for Razor Wind after taking Slash to kill the Kitty, and I can repeat it on the Dougie straight after. I send in my Nido King, being willing to sack it to a crit on Nido Queen if necessary, and take it out the turn after with a powerful earthquake of my own. 
I'm then able to repeat it on the king as well, but then go to Tangler on Rhydon, who manages to Oko it, and then pulls its weight even further, hitting a massive Sleep Powder, before I then go to Sand Slash and finish the job, and free the Pokemon from Rocket Hideout's grasp. We now have the Sylph Scope, meaning we can get one of the best Pokemon in the entire game, unlike my previous run that got this far. God. I'm gonna go to my own amnes- like, uh, my own sleeper. Oh, fuck off, man. Cool. Nah, but for real. Gengar is incredible in every single definition of the word. An amazing special stat, combined with blistering speed and awesome TM move pool, means that with a little bit of work and a whole lot of IVs, you can have one of the best attackers in the entire game. We catch ours and affectionately name it this. Great humour, right? Now comes a much more interesting section of the game, as to get to the next gym in Fuchsia City, you need Fly, as SHF designed the map so that the main hub of the town is raised up on ledges on all sides, meaning you can't just run around there like in vanilla. So you might be thinking, okay, just go west of Celadon and get Fly and go down. But what if I told you that you're blocked off by surf requirements from the Celadon side, meaning the only way to get the HM for Fly is to go all the way down routes 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, all in one split. All up, this split entails over 90 mandatory trainer battles. It's generally enthralling having to XP manage to such an extent as the AI are generally a lower level on the first couple of routes, but by the time you get down towards Fuchsia, there's a very good chance that your Pokemon are already pushing to the level cap. Considering how much work some of the main offensive Pokemon you use like Gengar, Dugtrio and Snorlax will be doing, my Snorlax is amazing and the first part of this marathon is pretty simple. Just grab the right mons, shoot on the opponent's chests and win. Oh and get crit by another Blizzard Clefable. Damn, these things are glued to my death count. At the same time, our encounters apart from Big Lax are actually kinda awful. It's fine because we get the good rod on this route. So we can go fishing for a couple new Pokemon in Tentacruel and Seedra. One of these Pokemon is a lot better than the other, with Seedra having decent stats across the board, but Tentacruel having great special and speed. After nearly an hour, I got from Lavender to Fuchsia with just a dead Parasect, and honestly the split's going pretty well so far. But how much longer can I keep this up? With big hitters already closing in on the level cap of 66, and the newly obtained XP all, I can at least shed the love a little bit. Fuchsia City does allow us to go and do one thing though, and that's get our Safari Zone encounter, as well as the Gold Teeth and the Surf HM. Safari Zone was completely reworked and is honestly a really impressive maze. Another cool quirk with this Safari is that there are two branching paths to take for each main point. One taking you to the secret house in the back, and the other to the Gold Teeth. SHF cooked so hard in the Safari that literally one wrong step will cost you everything. Well. Only 500 bucks, but still, you can get one of the best encounters in the entire game here, with the zone carrying monsters like Magma, Marchamp, Rhydon, Electabuzz, and Dratini. Literally any of these would be amazing additions to my box for the run, with them all being amazing at completely different things. I get Marchamp, which comes preloaded with some great physical moves, meaning I don't have to use any TMs on it. The trainers on Cycling Road are becoming much more threatening with them slowly creeping higher up towards the level cap, meaning that my former advantage is being eroded away. There's boom mons, powerful threats, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you get it at this point. There's really not that much that SHF could have done to make things any harder, apart from maybe level up a couple of Pokemon. The trainers on Cycling Road are very threatening, and there's really not much SHF could have done to make it harder. Well, actually, there is one thing he could have done. And let's make this route an absolute chore to go through. Forcing the players to play at general speed rather than flying through with emulation speed up. He added an enormous amount of cut trees, ledges and everything just to make the player suffer that bit more as the experience of a Kaizo game should give you. The absolute last trainer on the route carries just a single Gyarados which would have been fine if I had an electric type Pokemon still. 
However, my dumbass had Marcham lead on it and switched to Tentacruel to hit a Blizzard. But I got crit and missed the Blizzard, losing us yet another amazing Pokemon. This run is still somewhat crumbling before our very eyes, but funnily enough, we have everything we need. So is it really all bad? I don't think so. We have Surf on the near horizon with Koga being our next roadblock after getting the HM for fly. In between here and Koga, I shat on the entirety of Gen 1 with a single Weedle showing just how powerful the best bug is. But that's for another day, let's talk Koga. His gym is the same as in vanilla, but the trainers are moved, as per the usual from this point on. Koga though is on another level in Blue Kaizo. Looting a bug poison type that only knows Psychic is kinda questionable, but Tentacool and Gengar in the back are demonic powerhouses with great crit rates and special bulk. You already know how Weezing, Nidoking and Mr. Mime work as well. I kinda have to risk it from the offing here against Koga with my Arcanine lead having to send it with Fire Blast and hitting a very favourable range on the Venomoth. Second in is Weezing who loves to blow up on us, so I head over to Rhydon to take the explosion crit to the face as Mr. Mimes shows its face from behind all the walls. And Rhydon here is dead to Psychic, so I need a hard swap over to Arcanine once again and it hits another favourable range on Hyper Beam this time instead of Fire Blast. Nidoking now faces up to my dog, and this isn't really what I had originally planned, but I have to hard swap yet again to Nidoking this time, who tanks the Earthquake dodging the crit before firing back with its own to eviscerate Kogas. On Gengar here, I can go to Lax who unfortunately gets special dropped and slept, before Gengar decides it's had enough of this fight and blows up on me, letting me gang up on Tentacruel with a single sack of my Scyther that I got on Route 14, so I can get Pidgeot in safely to raise a wind and dodge yet another crit, win the speed tie, and win with just one death rather than wiping like I almost did, getting us the toxic badge for our issues. Now with the ability to surf around, we can pick up a lot more encounters, with Electabuzz, Dugong, Poliwag, Vileplume, Flareon, and arguably the best Pokemon in the game, with the tier alongside Slowbro, Aerodactyl. This guy is an absolutely amazing Pokemon in this game, with Rock Flying being an incredibly good offensive typing, and Aero having both types with actual stab in this game, unlike vanilla generation 1 where it got no rock moves, makes it so much better. You can make a genuine case for this being the MVP over Slowbro, with Sky Attack being buffed to the same extent that Razorwind was, while still retaining the flinch chance too. And to put it bluntly, my Aerodactyl was pretty much perfect for a run. For now, we're able to pop off himself, taking out a massive amount of the grunts, sometimes two or three at a time, and make it to the rival in one piece. For now though, we have one more rival fight to worry about before we can even think about the late game, and this one is the most dangerous yet by a mile. The lead Dodrio can be handled by my Rhydon and Aerodactyl pretty easily, as can Sandslash so long as I play my cards right. The third Mon in Exeggutor is pretty rough, and I bite the bullet, deciding that Aerodactyl is my main flying type from here on out, and I sack my Pidgeot to the Psycho Coconut to get my Aerodactyl back in to finish it off. Gyarados can be smashed by Electabuzz, and Mew takes the pair of Snorlax and Seedra to go down, but not with a little accuracy dropping and a little luck to go our way, allowing us to get our very own Lapras, a great bulky war, if not one of the best at the cost of one Pidgeot, which I'm really not going to complain about. Now though comes Boss Rocket himself to put me into a world of pain. His team is different gravy now, only keeping three mons from the first battle with him, now carrying a legendary as well to show us his true authority. I have a de facto counter to Persian with Aerodactyl being able to outspeed and clap its cheeks, as Nidoqueen comes in forcing me to risk double crit on my Lapras. And while it hit one, hitting both is fiction, allowing the big waterliner to go with a single blizzard in its face. A body slam and an earthquake takes down his pair of trade evos, as I go between Rhydon and Aerodactyl to kill off Tauros, leaving just the demon Zapdos while my Rhydon is way too low on HP. Completely unable to take two drill packs, considering the chance of one crit is nearly 50%. So I go into my mansion encounter, Flareon, who I was more willing to lose if I got crit and managed to break through, hitting both fire blasts through paralysis. If I lost Flareon here, chances are I probably would have just gone to Tangler and tried to sleep it but I will absolutely take a Deathless Giovanni when that opportunity comes. By now I assume you're slowly grasping just how good Aerodactyl is, right? In fact, this Aerodactyl being so great actually unlocks something for me to be possible, that in a lot of other runs wouldn't even be plausible, let alone almost certain. And that is beating Blaine before Sabrina at Sabrina's cap. Level 75 Max Attack Aerodactyl hits all of Blaine's Fire-type Pokemon for one-hit KOs, 
The only Pokemon it doesn't KO is his Chansey. You might be wondering how on earth a Chansey lives a Rock Slide but a Flareon can't. To put it simply as I can, in Blue Kaizo, Chansey is the wall. With its paper thin 5 base defense being buffed to a whopping 45. And while 45 still sounds quite awful as that's the same defense as pretty much Charmander, in the grand scheme of things, it's incredible on something with 250 HP. So for the fastest gym fight since Brock, I present to you, minus nine cap lane. Rock Slide takes out Charizard as I go to Marchamp on the egg to two hit KO with jump kicks before sacking my other fighting type in Hitmonlee to the Rapidash Horn Drill before I can get my Aerodactyl back in to slam Blaine's bald head into the earth, getting us our very own Volcano Badge. Now, you might be wondering why on earth I risked that before even fighting Sabrina, and it was actually so I could have something called the Badge Boost for myself to use against Sabrina. Blaine gives off the special Badge Boost, and a couple of other gym leaders will give off one themselves. However, the special Badge Boost is great for Sabrina, as the Psychic type is undoubtedly the most offensively powerful type in the game, and a 12.5% badge boost on my end makes her Pokemon a lot less threatening. I mean hell, look at this calc from her Hypno on my Marchamp with 115 special. Even he gets to live that hit with the special boost. Without it, I was taking a fair bit more damage than I would have otherwise. I lead my Aerodactyl against the scary Jinx and kill it with a Rock Slide as Slowbro comes out. Before she can even have the chance to get any Amnesias off, I'm able to Thunderbolt with Electabuzz and dodge a special drop to get the Hermit away from the field. Hypno comes out and wants to incapacitate me, so I go to Snorlax who can be beefy enough that I eventually get the Hyper Beam off and kill. I go to Flareon on the Exeggutor and sack it after a Fire Blast to retain momentum, and go back to Electabuzz on Starmie, leaving just the Alakazam in the back to deal with. I try and get a special drop on its first turn with Psychic, before having to switch to Aerodactyl so she can try and Thunder Wave before killing it off to get the Mask Badge, leaving just the final badge to get. As I'm sure you can tell by now, the late game of Blue Kaizo is really quite quick once you know what you're doing. And now all that's left for us is the final gym leader, Giovanni. His gym is a genuine one-way gauntlet. Like the one before Misty, with the panels only going further in, so you have to fight all eight of his gym trainers without leaving. You can still bring potions and whatever like before so it's not all bad, and the trainers in here are actually fairly tough as they're at a level where you can still get packed in harder than Vinicius Jr. at the 2024 Ballon d'Or. But hey, we'll still manage, right? I fight the first few trainers before leveling my Pokemon to the cap once I realize there's nearly no chance of me over leveling, before also picking up the Super Rod at long last. Now we can pick up two more amazing Pokemon. Route 20 gives us Staryu, a Pokemon that once evolved has no stab moves in its learn set funnily enough, and the Mewtwo killer itself, Slowpoke. Slowpoke obviously evolves into Slowbrute and has the move Amnesia. Our Slowpoke is... Uh, well, yeah, a bit of a disappointment. But aren't we all a little bit of a disappointment? It's okay, at least Staryu was solid. Now comes the final gym leader, Giovanni and he truly holds nothing back in his final battle, coming at us with Mewtwo itself. He still has his monstrously powerful team ahead of that to deal with though, still carrying threats like Tauros and Zapdos in the back. So let's get that Earth Badge, shall we? I lead with my Lapras this time, as we're pre-poisoned so we can kill the Persian anyway, as my entire team goes to 91 with the XP all. And I go to Tangler on the Dug Trio and put it to sleep, before heading out to Aerodactyl to kill with a guaranteed two-shot with Fly. Zapdos comes out, so I go to Rhydon, who has become the counter for this guy, as it only knows Drill Peck that can damage me. Gengar comes out, so I go for Earthquake, but get put to sleep before I can, which is a pain, and I realize that I probably should have pre-poisoned. I then switch to Snorlax, as I would have lost my Rhydon otherwise, and it blows up in my face, as I'm now fronted up to by Tauros. Tauros only uses normal attacks on my Aerodactyl, so I hard switch it in, but then... I get paralyzed. And to make matters worse... I get crit straight after. So in order to try and steer, I go to Slowbro and in an attempt to set up a single Amnesia before trying to Psychic, I get critical hyperbeamed. And from here, there's no way out. And it's game, set, match to Giovanni as I get swept in a matter of seconds. A rather inglorious end to a run that quite literally had everything. From almost falling to the wayside before the 5th gym, and then all of a sudden looking like a genuine contender to go all the way and becoming the ultimate recovery mission, finally collapsing to one of the biggest run killers of late game and Generation 1's raw power. 
a run that in some ways made me fall back in love with Nuzlocking. So to be honest with you all, at one point I was just doing this stuff so I could have content, and not for the enjoyment or anything. But Blue Kaizo and making this video itself has also made me realise that I can do things I didn't know were possible. Considering three and a half years ago, if you told me I nearly got eight badges in a hardcore Nuzlocke of this game to little old me, after he beat this game as a regular Nuzlocke way back when, I think he would have been proud, and you bet your ass I am. You don't think I'm done there, do you? Come on now, I'm gonna beat this game, even if it's the last thing I do.